Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to moderate this webinar on the question of how to improve the value of ESG disclosure, meaning the environmental, social, and governance information published by companies. This meeting is hosted by European issuers and partnered by NASDAQ. For those not familiar with European issuers, we are a pan-European organization representing the interests of publicly quoted companies across Europe. Our members are both companies from all sectors and companies associations in 15 European countries, representing a combined market capitalization of almost 8 trillion euros. I am honored to welcome our four panelists, uh, Sirpi Pietikainen, member of the EU Parliament, Thomas Tiblat, head of ESG solutions for European market and uh, vice president of NASDAQ, Christine Negrini, CSR senior manager at RWE, and Patron Janus, who is investor relations and CSR reporting manager at Total. We are going to discuss ESG disclosures for about 40 minutes. There will be an interactive part with a poll session with questions that our panelists have prepared for you, our audience. And finally, there will be a Q&A session of about 15 minutes before we conclude at 12 p.m. Let me start with a few words of introduction. We are facing global challenges of climate change, loss of biodiversity and many human rights issues. Investors need reliable, comparable and material information to select the most sustainable uh, companies to invest in. Companies are under intense scrutiny to disclose an ever-increasing amount of ESG information. In the EU, reporting requirements are under review, and there are multiple international initi initiatives, making it quite difficult for issuers to respond to. This is why European issuers has repeatedly called for a unique reporting standard to stop confusion and costs for both issuers and investors. We have certainly reached a turning point in Europe with the launch by EFRAG of preparatory work for an EU standard of non-financial information to be delivered by June 2022. What I would like our panelists to tell us first is how they view ESG reporting standards and their added value today. And secondly, I would like them to imagine what a new standardization of non-financial information could deliver and how investors, companies, stock exchanges and policymakers could work together to improve the value of ESG disclosure. So let me first turn to Sirpa Pietikainen. Sirpa, you have been instrumental in shaping the EU sustainable finance agenda and regulatory framework. There are many new pieces of EU legislation, including the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, NFRD, which is currently under review. Secondly, the taxonomy regulation, which introduces a new reporting obligation for corporates to disclose the proportion of their turnover, expenditures and investments derived from sustainable activities. And finally, there is the disclosure regulation for institutional investors, which will also impact issuers because investors will inevitably turn towards them to find the information they will have to disclose themselves. So as a policymaker, how will you ensure that this all fits together and that there is the necessary coherence and also a level playing field with our non-EU competitors who should be required to comply with the same reporting requirements as EU companies when they propose their products and services in the EU. Sirpo, the floor is yours. Five minutes, please. I'll have to be a strict timekeeper. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for organizing this extremely important discussion. And I, uh, to start with, urge you all to be very st strong towards the politicians in the European Parliament and uh, the finance ministers and the uh, ministers of economy um, and trade in member states and the commission to, uh, to uh, ensure this uh, harmonized uh, integrated reporting framework that you mentioned, uh, mentioned. I think that this is the most important of all other questions. And this is a bit like herding a... a uh, a bunch of kids running to all of the uh, directions, 
uh, of uh, trying to manage different kind of initiatives and uh, indicators. And then, as you know, we have SDGs and we have um, um, uh, company liability, uh, environmental liability uh, 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 initiatives and others. Okay, let's start with that. My first point is that uh, we should take this information a bit like we uh, take the uh, economic information in uh, company and accounting reporting. And indeed, there has been initial discussions with the IFRS. This framework of ESG reporting should be part uh, of IFRS, if you ask me, in the longer run. (laughs) It needs to be global because com- financial market, markets and, and uh, companies are global. And there might be other home bases than IFRS, but to me, while it uh, uh, links so um, uh, 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 directly to company reporting, that would be the right place for it. Then, second, secondly, uh, someone needs to start this and to be uh, to be the uh, motor, uh, the uh, uh, motor uh, to to push it forward. And this is the role of the EU, and this is what we are trying to do. And there's uh, initial baby steps what we have taken, so most of the work is uh, ahead of us. This means that we uh, need the taxonomy. The taxonomy is sort of the base regulation what you measure and how you measure. And that sort of lays the uh, uh, foundations on, uh, uh, in, in the longer run, if you ask me, the whole ESG reporting. And uh, on both ends, not only what is green, but what is the 50 shades of green and gray in between. And then what is the other end? And I don't long want to call them black or brown. It is uh, double, uh, double or triple risk uh, assessment. So they are risk invest, uh, risk investments, because uh, if you have run out of uh, climate change, that uh, certainly is going to be a, a business risks also. Okay, then we would need the initiative uh, to have a, this kind of a harmonized database and regulation. How you calculate CO two emissions? How you calculate biodiversity emissions? Uh, uh, the consumptions of raw materials and uh, the indirect land use and a couple of uh, uh, other factors, about the eight factors. And then a harmonized understanding uh, in this platform, how you calculate. This is the life cycle analysis so that it is duly from the first step to the uh, last breath of the material. And with this uh, sort of a reporting framework, we would need to ensure that it is across all the sectors, across all the regulation, financial regulation, it is uh, uh, non-financial reporting, it is uh, uh, due diligence requirements, but of course it needs to be in the public uh, framework and we have this huge resilience and recovery fund at the moment, so it needs to be there. Plus, then, uh, it needs to be set in all different sectors of budgets, uh, EU budgets and uh, national budgets, because otherwise there's a great confusion. And last, I have a minute left. So the information is there and the calculation models are there. The point is that they are not harmonized. This is not that big initiative to do a couple of wor- um, a years work, but someone needs to take the initiative. Someone needs to do that and then to create a simplified version where you can see what is the CO2 or biodiversity impact of my car, because we need to ensure that uh, this data is really readily available uh, for uh, for SMEs, because we do not want to exclude them out of uh, out of this. Uh, data uh, data possibilities to have the green finance. Thank you. Thank you, Sirpa. And five minutes, um, perfectly respected. It's really great. So turning to Thomas Tiblert from NASDAQ, uh, we are keen to have your views on ESG disclosure and um, what is the role of stock exchange in this respect? Do you think that uh, 
increase of ESG requirements may also be a barrier to access financial markets, especially for SMEs. Sirpa has touched upon this issue. So um, uh, Thomas has also a poll question for the audience, which will appear shortly on the screen. Uh, the audience will just have to click on answer and then confirm your answer and we'll have the results later. So over to you, Thomas. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, and thanks for giving me, giving me the opportunity to talk here. Uh, first, some uh, uh, general views on the ESG disclosures. Uh, I mean, we, we see it's multiple uh, standards, and I can really see this as a challenge for, for corporates to stay ahead of all this and to, to face all these uh, resource-intensive uh, uh, reporting. Um, we see that the uh, the EU taxonomy, which Sirpa talked about, it's it's uh, really going to be a, a very important part of, of the uh, regulation here and the reporting here coming in the next uh, uh, few coming years. Uh, and I think it's going to be a really important factor to drive uh, uh, standardization in, in the longer run. Uh, that said, I think still we have a lot of uh, we have had a lot of self-regulation and market forces driving the reporting as well, which has been strong, and, and uh, I believe that's going to be stay for uh, in the future as well as a complement to the regulation. We have seen in the Nordic region, for instance, uh, a lot of development during the last years, uh, despite uh, uh, limited regulation. Um, in terms of the uh, SMEs and the EC reporting, um, especially if we focus on the E uh, in the ESG, uh, I think it's really important to see that the the largest companies are the uh, the uh, what has to be focused on. It should be rooted in the materiality analysis. Um, and uh, since many SMEs, they don't have the same same capabilities or resources or uh, in-house knowledge to, to keep up with uh, too detailed and too cumbersome uh, uh, reporting, I think that has to be uh, kept in mind. Because um, if we can find a strike balance in terms of the, the uh, comprehensiveness, uh, I think we can get more SMEs to be to opt in and to uh, start to report uh, and thereby also start to work on these very important uh, aspects. I mean, what, what you measure, you manage, you can say. So, and in terms of uh, as, as a stock exchange, the role we have, um, I think we have a quite unique role since we sit between the, both the corporates and uh, in between the corporates and in the investors. And uh, the stock exchange's fundamental role is, is to support the companies and the corporates to raise capital. I mean, that's, that's our basic role. So in that sense, I think uh, what we are working with is to support uh, corporates to prepare for the transformation, to prepare how to uh, move over to a sustainable business model and to prepare how to disclose information to the various stakeholders. I think that is really important for everyone to ensure they have access to capital over time in the long run. So what we do and the role we have is to facilitate a dialogue, to facilitate uh, and to ensure awareness, to have training, technology and, and, and tools for the corporates uh, in relation to ESG reporting. And thereby, hopefully, we can get an effective and efficient way of, of uh, uh, disclosing this important data. And in the end, create better transparency, which is the, the once again, the basic role of the, the stock exchange. Uh, and in doing that, I mean, we, we have, uh, from NASDAQ, you have a number of different initiatives in order to support the corporates. So just to list a few, we, we have our uh, ESG reporting guide, which is a very like practical tool where we... Uh, help the corporates in this jungle of the different reporting standards, et cetera, how to approach the, the uh, report in a, even it actually a suggested on, on metrics. We have, um, secondly, we have a ESG data portal where we have more than 500 companies actually disclosing data, ESG data directly in, into this in order to uh, make available for, for investors in an in a easy way. And then we have uh, more than 90% of our benchmark index uh, companies 
are actually reporting on scope one, scope two emissions, more than 70% reporting on, on scope three emissions. Um, and lastly, uh, uh, as an example, we also have uh, in, in the education, we, uh, uh, the mandatory education for all listed companies, uh, we have included the ESG section as well to ensure that all the companies, also smaller companies, are getting this on the agenda and start to work with this uh, on this very important topic. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Thomas. Let us now turn to uh, Christine and Bertrand, who will give us their point of view as preparers and who will also have four questions for you. Uh, Christine, would you like to start? I'm happy to do so, and thank you for inviting me. So um, from a preparer's point of view, um, I don't have to mention that sustainability is not a matter. Um, I, I mean, sustainability is a matter which requires the joint efforts, and I'm really convinced that we are all committed to sustainability. And I'm explicitly not focusing on the good things we've already done, but on the challenges to optimize the future. So from a preparer's point of view, we have the, the challenge that we have various frameworks or different standards, um, especially as an international acting company, and we all internal reporting requirements. So the efforts uh, data preparers needs to put in that reporting also for the users of data. Additionally, we have various developments with a pe uh, perspective to establish new standards. So um, it was already mentioned sustainable finance or the new reporting um, standard established by the AFRAG or even the revision of the non-financial reporting directive. From my point of view, um, we've seen a lot of discussed KPIs to be reported on, but not all, not the complete sum of KPIs which were discussed are sensible and meaningful for all companies or reporting organizations because there is no application to all industries. Um, one remark um, from my experience um, within the companies, establishing of new reporting processes might take up to one year to have a robust reporting process implemented, which also means that um, historical data are quite difficult to evaluate. So we need to talk about the future, right? In order to make um, the sustainability reporting useful and efficient, I'd like to, um, well, focus on two topics. Um, first of all, what data are needed that in various developments, the dialogue is already foreseen to have an exchange about what data are, well, useful, what data are needed to decrease the effort both on preparers and user side, B, how the reporting shall be established. Is there any additional optimization potential? So as an example, would a data pool um, be useful? Um, for example, like the already existing supplier platforms that would, from a company's perspective, decrease the number of ratings, but also the effort of auditing while for data users, there might be one place where all the information is available. So to conclude my little statement, the goal of CR reporting shall be transparent and robust, but also comparable. So um, a harmonization of the standards are needed and um, the comparability um, would maybe mean that we have like a limited set of joint KPIs where all companies and reporting organizations shall report on, but maybe we should also think about uh, sector-specific supplements to make certain KPIs comparable. And this would also mean that we have like a level playing field of companies within one industry that might be helpful. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Christine. So um, let's turn to Bertrand to continue with the issuer's point of view. Bertrand? 
Yes, uh, thank you for inviting me to this conference. Uh, so I will add on onto what uh, Christina just just said from the uh, preparer's perspective. So for a, a company headquartered in, in France like Total, uh, uh, 10 years ago, the, the situation uh, was uh, not too bad in terms of sustainability reporting. In France, we already had legal obligations to re report sustainability information since uh, 2002 and uh, in the 2000s uh, the global reporting initiative GRI was progressively uh, uh, used by more and more companies uh, and, and becoming a, a sustainability reporting standard and on top of that many companies uh, also responded uh, to the daily questionnaires uh, of the CBP on climate change and um, uh, the, the Dalgeon Sustainability Index uh, questionnaire. And then things got uh, very complicated uh, from 2010. Uh, uh, just to name a few initiatives, I think uh, most of the people in the audience are familiar with. Uh, <clears throat> it started with um, uh, integrated reporting uh, in 2010 that came up with the framework in 2013. Then SASB in the United States uh, started uh, in 2011, and they defined uh, uh, sustainability reporting standards for uh, 77 in industrial sectors uh, in 2018. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the GRI decided uh, to change uh, its uh, framework uh, uh, and had successfully uh, version G4 in 2013 and then the standards in 2016. Uh, and now it's also reintroducing uh, some sector supplements uh, for, for different sectors. There is a, a consultation on the way for the oil and gas sector right now. Then the EU, uh, as everyone knows, uh, had its uh, directive uh, on non-financial reporting in 2014, which took a while to be transposed into uh, local legislation. In France, it was in 2017. And we are now uh, using that uh, with uh, the French additions uh, to, to that directive. In France, we have also another important piece of legislation uh, that's called the duty of vigilance. And there is now a discussion on the way that uh, this could become a, a European uh, legislation. And so, uh, and uh, not forgetting the TCFD um, that came uh, and uh, is now more or less becoming a standard for climate reporting. And so each time there is a, a new requirement, uh, it adds another layer to what uh, the company uh, has to report. It never replaces something. Uh, it, uh, it always comes on top uh, of, of what we are already reporting. And uh, this year uh, we had have got pressure from uh, investors, uh, in particular BlackRock and, and State Street at the beginning of the year that companies should use uh, SASB as a reporting standard. And right now, Total uh, is in the midst of preparing our first uh, SASB report. Uh, uh, it will be put online uh, sometime during the month of October. And uh, there has been another initiative uh, recently with the World Economic Forum and the so-called Big Four. And uh, last week, they have issued a revised uh, proposal of uh, common uh, ESG metrics uh, for all companies uh, to, to use. And Total, uh, as a member of the International Business Forum uh, Council, sorry, uh, also intends to uh, introduce those metrics uh, in its uh, 2020 uh, annual report uh, that we will start uh, preparing in October. So uh, uh, it's uh, very complicated uh, from uh, a company's perspective, and uh, we are hoping for the holy grail uh, and a convergence uh, of all these uh, standards. Uh, but uh, I'm not very hopeful, given the, the current situation, that uh, uh, we'll be able to, to get there very soon. Thank you very much, uh, Bertrand. I know that uh, your despair about the uh, multiple frameworks is shared by many, many other companies. So thank you for... for for presenting this uh, this uh, quite difficult and complicated situation for, for issuers. I would like to um, turn back to Sirpa with a second question. Uh, Sirpa, how do you view the launch of the future EU standard, EU reporting standard, and how can we ensure the take-up of this standard by other jurisdictions and initiatives 
to avoid that the EU companies will have to comply with different sets of reporting requirements when they operate worldwide. So um, that's that's the first question. Second is, uh, uh, should the EU create a single ESG database to facilitate access for users? Christine mentioned a similar idea. Um, do you have any views on this to share? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll uh, start with the latter question. Yes, EU should uh, uh, establish this database. <clears throat> but while uh, EU established this uh, sustainable uh, finance global <clears throat> uh, platform, uh, this is something what we would need to discuss with partners. And not only in governance, but uh, uh, with uh, uh, investors and uh, the companies how to ensure that this kind of a database is using exactly what I said, the uh, standardized, uh, harmonized uh, calculation methods of CO2 emissions, or this or that, and what is measured. And uh, my opinion very initially is that it could be uh, linked to Eurostat, so it should be somewhere easily accessible for SMEs, and this kind of a simply use uh, Ready use data, uh, database for ESG uh, data uh, that then, uh, if we think uh, growing companies or uh, very small SMEs, they could exactly on, um, on uh, quite sort of a um, product level file, find, the, uh, find the information and then the calculation method. But then the uh, first question that is much harder, and I just uh, share your worry. Uh, um, w what you uh, said about this company uh, reporting uh, plethora uh, of uh, reporting <clears throat> initiatives, because uh, this is a, uh, also a chaos from the perspective of policymaker, but that is a minor headache. What is the major headache is that uh, if you have a different kind of a reporting system, you lose totally the comparability. You lose the effectiveness of investments. And besides, you can not know, not in EU level nor in global level, whether you are choosing the best and most effective actions and tools to curb down climate change or biodiversity loss. It is just the situation, think if we would have 250 different kind of uh, accounting standards and it wouldn't be open uh, how you uh, calculate them. And then just company this or that introduces uh, reporting this or that framework and uh, then uh, 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 the requirements from uh, different parts of the world or different parts of uh, investors would be totally different. And this is exactly the situation. And I share the worry about this blooming of different kind of uh, uh, initiatives and demands. You have to use this or you have to use that. And when I just calculated, I had a lengthy talk with the World Economic Forum. According to their uh, calculations, indeed, there are 250 uh, reporting and standard schemes at the moment. More, uh, a bit, uh, more than 20 of them are uh, widely used, but anyway, that describes the, uh, the, the, the whole sort of a rainbow of possibilities. And even to get it more difficult, there is 20 uh, e e official or uh, company-based or inofficial initiatives co co to coordinate these reporting standards. So next uh, round, we probably would need a, a coordination initiative of a coordination initiatives of reporting initiatives. And I think that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm relying very uh, heavily on, on uh, stock agencies and uh, investors to, to firstly put their actions together globally. Because if you sort of look at uh, SASP or some other reporting in uh, uh, frameworks, there are a lot of good on them. And it wouldn't, as I said in my first intervention, it wouldn't take that lot of a time, probably a year or two or something uh, within three years, to sort of make a new one based on the existing reporting schemes. And so when uh, I'm talking about the European system, I'm not sort of a talking a 
another new reporting framework, but uh, this kind of a major initiative that uh, uh, we would globally really agree what is the uh, harmonized standard. And I don't think that uh, in policy level, you know how uh, the politics is in the globally at the moment, that would happen. But if we could have uh, the benchmarking initiatives, we could have uh, the stability board, we could have the IFRS, we could have the stock exchanges, getting together and discussing it and sort of agreeing voluntarily what would be uh, what would be the best uh, set of uh, framework not choosing one over another but sort of a putting uh, putting them together and sort of a fine tuning the differences and to conclude what is the most important is there would need to be just like in credit rating agencies or accounting there would need to be transparency about how this is calculated how this is evaluated and why uh, this uh, has a bit of more weight than that one. And then we would l need to leave a bit more leeway, flexibility for investors and industries to, to have different kind of a set of uh, solutions, be it uh, uh, concrete or be it uh, wood or be it glass in, in construction, for example, because with different kind of a sets you can achieve this different kind of a benefits. I don't know if I helped you at, uh, uh, at all, but this is uh, quite a mess that you would need everybody try to come together and really uh, with the willingness to, to sort this out and start creating on, on the basis of existing ones the, uh, the new sort of a scheme. And I, then I think that the stock exchanges could be a, a in beautiful place for that because uh, you have been in avant garde on on creating the 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 standards also, and uh, this is sort of a, the public information uh, place anyway for for company information. Thank you so much, Sirpa. I think there are some very important thoughts um, uh, to take because uh, what you say uh, is that the EU should not reinvent the wheel. I think that's something the Commission has also said repeatedly and that um, there should be a global cooperation on this issue which touches upon global issues uh, and probably uh, a solution would be to... Uh, as the EU uh, to take more influence in the global discussions and uh, maybe the EU initiative that is being launched will give the EU also more credibility and uh, political influence to to uh, weigh its weight uh, in the international discussions. But you also made a perfect transition uh, to hand over to Thomas again to ask uh, him what um, the future developments in ESG uh, disclosure uh, could be uh, could look like uh, and uh, whether you see as an exchange as a stock exchange um, a way to support the process and the participants in the market okay Thomas. thank you thank you and uh, i fully agree with uh, Sirpa that uh, we should not, not aim to find another uh, standard another reporting framework or we we need to find a a uh, uh, to harmonize based on the existing uh, standards. I fully agree with that. And uh, uh, some general uh, thoughts and uh, a little bit based on, I mean, we operate uh, stock exchanges both in, in Europe and, and in the US. And if you look at the the difference here, uh, I think we have seen for many years the the European side being ahead and driving this process to a very large extent, both driven by the corporates and investors, but, but very much also on, uh, from, from the regulators. Um, and I think uh, uh, this has given us an opportunity to, to be a little bit on, in the driver's seat. And I agree with Elizabeth's last comments that we should probably uh, try to uh, keep that position and also to, to uh, work actively towards other regions in order to, to get uh, them aligned with, uh, with for instance, the, the EU taxonomy and that, that framework. That said, uh, we have seen, and also like uh, uh, Patron said before, I've seen a lot of uh, initiatives lately in, in US, I must say, from, from primarily the investor side, some of the larger corporates as well in the ESG area. So uh, uh, 
once again, in, in that sense, I think we should aim to that uh, EU make an attempt to to gather the the different regions in order to drive the the standardization. Um, Still, I think it's also important that uh, since the market forces are quite quick and there will most likely be a lot of uh, new initiatives and, and uh, tweaking of, of uh, sort of data, etc. Uh, I think it's important that the uh, platform on sustainable finance is dynamic and pragmatic and, and thereby can uh, are able to introduce changes if reasonable in order to keep the alignment with, with other regions. Um, but as uh, Bertrand said, uh, most likely uh, we will have to live with a number of standards for, for some, some times. I, I would expect that, even though I think everyone wants a better harmonization, better framework, etc. Uh, but I think we have to be prepared and the corporate had to be prepared for that. Um, one last, uh, uh, also just a one remark in general terms uh, is I think we're going to see so much more focus on the S in the ESG. You can see that in the wake of the COVID, etc. So that is something to bear in mind. But our role as a stock exchange of what we can do, um, once again, I think we can work on different levels. One is, is to facilitate this discussion and be taking part of this discussion, what uh, Sirpa also mentioned, and we are very happy to, to be active in that space, both in the more uh, regional or European uh, perspective, but also on the more uh, global perspective with the, for instance, the sustainable uh, stock exchanges, the UN partnership we have there. But the second uh, is also to be more uh, active in the more practical ways to support the, the corporates uh, with more practical tools, uh, since we probably have to prepare for uh, parallel standards for some time. For instance, we have like a one report, a workflow tool we have uh, that can support the corporates in order to make the life a little bit easier in terms of supplying data and, and, and to do it in a more efficient way and uh, harmonize at least the way to disclose the data to different recipients. And also we have uh, uh, support in transparency in terms of uh, platform for uh, sustainable bonds where we have something we call the NASDAQ Sustainable Bond Network for issuers to upload data in a, in a structured way and thereby facilitate and improve, improve the transparency in the, in the sustainable bond market. So uh, lastly, uh, I think still, uh, of course, it's, it's really important that we continue the cooperation in joint efforts. Uh, seminars like this is good as well in order to streamline and, and harmonize the thinking and the way forward. So I think uh, in, in the end, we want to achieve the same thing, to, to create a sustainable economic society, but, but taking into account the limited resources we're having in each organization. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, before handing over to um, Christine and Bertrand, I will, result, I will announce the results of your poll right away because you were just talking about the way the stock exchanges can support uh, issuers. So there was a clear preference for your first um, option, which is ESG reporting guides and ESG advisory services, 46%, then 23% for the Workflow, workflow tools and data portals, 15% for the structured data, simplified direct communication between investors and issuers, and at last 13% for the footprint tools to bridge gaps and standards. So clear preference for the first and decreasing interest, but um, uh, still uh, a lot of work for you to do. Thank you so much, Thomas. So we will go back to uh, Christine and Bertrand to uh, ask them how they view the EU initiative for the reporting standard versus global initiative. Thank you, Christine, if you want to start. Or I'm happy to do so. So um, I have just mentioned that Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Hello? Okay, great. 
Thank you. I've just mentioned that sustainability is a matter of all. Um, it requires joint efforts. And therefore, I'm, I'm a really friend of seeing, of seeing chances, right, and not disadvantages. So I consider the EU initiative as a really great chance for all of us. The um, to be established EU standard could serve um, as a basis for, uh, for the world, let's say. Um, within the EU, we have broad experience with um, sustainability reporting, with standards, um, right? So the um, standard could serve, um, the EU could work as a front runner, right, to show that um, a common standard could work and this standard could create a level playing field, surely among companies, but firstly within Europe for a robust and transparent reporting and maybe on a later time scale globally. And from a preparer's point of view, it is really important to harmonize and localize data. This might decrease internal resources, talking about efforts, right? Because sustainability in a first step costs a lot of money, but it needs to pay off um, also for companies. And by decreasing internal resources for processes and gathering information, we could put that resources um, into increasing quality of reporting. And therefore, I'm really looking forward to have a robust EU standard. Thank you. Great. I fully agree. Bertrand, what are your views on this? Yes, uh, as I said before, um, uh, as a French company, we are we are used to uh, legal uh, sustainability reporting, and so of course, uh, as a European company, we also welcome uh, the EU's uh, initiative uh, uh, to go uh, one step further with uh, the revision of the NFRD. Uh, which will hopefully uh, be uh, not uh, another directive that needs to be transposed uh, into uh, members' uh, legislation, uh, but uh, be a, a European regulation. And we also welcome the initiative to define uh, common uh, ESG reporting standards uh, for all European companies. Uh, so, and as I said before, if uh, anything that can reduce uh, uh, the company reporting burden uh, is uh, is welcome and the dream situation uh, would be that companies uh, could provide all uh, uh, material ESG information and feed it uh, into uh, uh, mm -hmm. an online platform where all uh, stakeholders, investors and others uh, could then use uh, uh, this information uh, and uh, make their, their decisions about uh, about the companies and, and, and engage in dialogue uh, but uh, having the, the basic information that they need already uh, uh, at, uh, at the onset. Uh, and, uh, and so we are very hopeful that uh, this uh, initiative by the EU will succeed. Uh, I have uh, two concerns. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the first one uh, is uh, uh, about timing. As you said uh, during the introduction, Elizabeth, uh, uh, this uh, work uh, with uh, having uh, achieved these uh, common ESG standards for Europe uh, is planned uh, to, uh, to be uh, finished by June 2022. And, and, and the question then for companies is, uh, will we be able to uh, use these uh, new standards, uh, these uh, ESG indicators, as early as uh, reporting period 22? Or should we wait uh, for another year to, to, to get it ready? Uh, and, and then it would be published in 2024 on reporting cycle 23. And uh, so, so, so you see, uh, it will take some time for, for this to be ready. And meanwhile, there will be a few uh, reporting cycles. And I'm afraid that uh, market solutions uh, will not wait uh, for the EU to be ready and will uh, put forward uh, their solution. And we already see it with the very strong push we are getting from investors uh, regarding uh, using the SASB standard. And uh, if uh, companies get uh, used to reporting um, on, on SASB uh, and, and 
continue uh, to, to report on other standards. Uh, maybe the EU uh, will be a bit uh, too late when it comes in. And although it will be a legal obligation, uh, so companies, of course, will comply with it. Uh, it will not uh, enable them to uh, really get rid of the, of the other standards. This is the first uh, concern I have. And the second one uh, is uh, about uh, the, the perimeter of, uh, of the reporting. Uh, will, uh, uh, for, for a worldwide company, uh, of course, uh, you would like to have uh, one single framework uh, to report on all your activities. And if you are a company uh, located outside uh, of, uh, of Europe, uh, uh, will this standard also uh, apply to you? Uh, and this uh, links also to concerns uh, many companies are having currently with uh, uh, the proposed uh, legislation on sustainable finance, uh, where it's not clear, for instance, whether taxonomy compliant activities will apply only for operations located uh, in Europe or also for operations uh, in other legislations. So there are questions we are having uh, about the future, but uh, I will not finish uh, with a negative uh, uh, stance. I, uh, I, 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 I'm really hopeful that uh, the EU initiative uh, will succeed and that uh, companies in Europe and outside of Europe uh, will be using the, the new reporting standards when they are ready. Thank you so much, Petro, and you really raise very important points uh, that we will also um, deliver to the EU uh, institutions as European issuers and uh, the question of cooperation uh, with uh, the other existing initiatives is essential to avoid the, the pitfalls you just mentioned that we have different different uh, standards in the end. So uh, if we all work together, probably we can achieve maybe some convergence on essential points. So uh, we uh, will now move to the results of the poll session. And in the meanwhile, uh, also uh, to announce the Q&A session afterwards, you will be able to ask your questions by um, uh, clicking on the orange button, ask a question, and you can uh, write down your questions, which um, uh, our operators will then uh, present right afterwards. So, uh, the results of the poll question number one uh, about the ESG reporting frameworks. Uh, do you think that they will be harmonized and standardized in the coming years? Option one, um, yes, with not too long distance, 40%. Second uh, option, yes, but only for one region. So, for example, for Europe, 43, slightly more, 43%. And then uh, the, the very pessimistic uh, uh, answer no issues will have to continue with the current nightmare that was 17 percent so we have divided votes on the first two options with a slight majority 43 percent for the regional solution uh, by for example europe uh, second poll question we have already dealt with that was on the stock exchanges and so um Christine's question number three was where do you get the ESG information um from companies, 41% from the annual report, 55% majority from the sustainability report, uh, zero from individual exchange. We probably have not so many investors in the in the audience because we know that they do exchange uh, with, with issuers directly and 3% others. So big majority from the sustainability reports, 55% and annual report, 41%. And at last, uh, Bertrand's question on which initiative uh, will become the most commonly accepted ESG reporting standard. So, suspense, suspense. We have 19% uh, for GRI, 7% for SASB, the big four initiative from the World Economic Forum, 7%. The EU standard, the upcoming future EU standard, 41%, so a very, very comfortable majority. And then 30%, again, uh, think that there will be no universal ESG uh, standard that will emerge. So um, EU standard 41, GRI 19, SASB 7, Big 4, 7%. So thank you to the audience to, uh, to give you 
give us your input. That's very uh, precious. And now we will move to the question and answer session. And uh, I will let um, Bade from European Issuers uh, present the questions. Uh, I have one appearing on my screen from the viewer. Um, Bade, can you present it to us? Can you read it out? Yes, of course. Uh, so the first question came from Mr. Tommy Nederman, and uh, his question is to Thomas. He says, Thomas mentions the S in ESG and the importance of this aspect will increase. Can he give some insight on what this means in practice from a disclosure perspective? What do investors wish to follow up on regarding the S? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think in, in general terms, uh, as I said, we have seen previously has been very much focused on the E, but but uh, lately it has been increasing focus on the S. I think in terms of, of metrics, in terms of data points, uh, there are a range of, of different uh, existing today. Uh, but uh, what's I think uh, what's important here is that it's still fairly new and young. Uh, area. So I think we have to be be aware of that it, this request and the need for data is is, is going to change. I think it's, it was a really interesting article in Risk.net today about this, how investors are looking in the wake of, of the pandemic and where they, they see that they have uh, not sufficiently accurate data and not sufficient uh, number of data points in this area. Uh, so I think uh, <laughs> we, we probably have to be prepared that it's going to be uh, increased focus on that, that side and also increased focus on various data points in the social. And that can be diversity, it could be the, uh, the uh, how are uh, companies handling uh, the staff in, these, in the situation of, uh, of a pandemic and how much uh, uh, do they support their staff as an example. And then, of course, you can get into a hen and chicken and egg, uh, egg discussion whether uh, companies with strong financials can support their their uh, their uh, staff, or is it uh, because they have a good and thereby have a good result and a good good uh, development, or is it because they have this this uh, policy that is giving the the good result? That's uh, something to look, look into. But I think it's important to, to, to realize that this area is going to be uh, increasingly important. Thank you, Thomas. Do we have another question? Yes, there is a second question again for Thomas uh, from Sven de Villoutreis. He's asking, have you seen a lot of, uh, you said you have seen a lot of initiatives lately in the U.S. on reporting standards. Could you elaborate on which initiatives these are and how you expect them to grow? Which place you expect them to take in the global scene versus EU standards, for instance? I think it's uh, one, one example is probably uh, a good example is Bertrand's, uh, where we saw BlackRock uh, going out quite uh, tough in the beginning of the, of the year and really advocating the, the SASB and that that should be the, the standard and they are coming from a very strong strong position and, and uh, uh, moving in, in, that, uh, in that direction. And of course, uh, once again, that we uh, discussed before, I think it's important that EU really try to promote their framework uh, in order to, to get a, as much harmonization in the EU taxonomy over the other side of the Atlantic as well. Uh, and then you have other initiatives in terms of actually corporates that are uh, getting together and, and uh, uh, promoting various uh, areas in the ESG space and, and uh, uh, how, to, how to handle their carbon emission, how to handle the carbon uh, uh, disclosure, etc., and go into towards the negative side. Thank you. Any other questions for other panelists? Um, from uh, follow up of the previous question, um, the first question, he was the the viewer was asking what was the name of the article that Thomas was mentioning. <laughs> uh, if you give me a, a minute here, and I bring it up. 
Um, Maybe there's another question for some of the other <laughs> panelists in the meanwhile, so that we don't discriminate. And yeah, yes, we haven't received. Um, the presentations were too clear to raise any questions. Can be a compliment. The, the name of the article was uh, Fund Managers Seek to Plug Holes in ESG Data, RISC.net, today. Social, social Intel proves elusive as a virus reawakens uh, sense of corporate future. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, we will conclude. No regrets? Well, then, then let me please conclude this webinar by thanking all the panelists and the audience for participating in this very rich debate. I think we have touched upon many issues that are important, not only for issuers, but also for investors and stakeholders at large in order to improve the value of ESG disclosures. And uh, I think a lot still needs to be done. And I believe the solution will come by continuing a constructive dialogue like the one we've had this morning. So thank you all very much and uh, have a nice day. Bye bye. You too. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you, Sirpa, for taking the time to be with us. Thank Happy to do it anytime. Thank you very much.